Coming up next on My Week, we wrap up the Mackinac Policy Conference with a look at the week's highlights. Plus, where do we go from here? Stay put. My Week from Mackinac Island starts right now. Support for My Week at the Mackinac Policy Conference is brought to you by Masco Corporation Foundation, DTE Energy Foundation, ITC Holdings Corporation, PVS Chemicals, and by... Did you know... Gordon Food Service was started by a 23-year-old entrepreneur as a butter and egg delivery business more than a century ago. In 1948, school teacher Gerard Wendell Hayworth borrowed $10,000 from his parents to start a woodworking operation in his family's garage. It's now Hayworth Incorporated. These are just some of the ways Michigan's pioneers started out as small companies with big ideas. We are business leaders for Michigan. We are committed to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding for this program is provided by Delta Airlines. Keep climbing. Good evening, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Christy McDonald. We are at the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island for the last day of the Detroit Regional Chamber's Mackinac Policy Conference. There has been a lot of discussion here on the island about topics that impact the entire state of Michigan. So coming up, we're going to take a closer look at the messages from this year's speakers about solving issues and moving Michigan forward. Also, what should we take away from this year's conference? We'll talk about what happens next, and the under-the-radar Michigan team gives us a fun history lesson on the pool here at the Grand Hotel. It's pretty cool. So let's get started with our MyWeek contributors, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press. Guys, it's Friday on Mackinac Island, and my voice is at least 20 <laughs> octaves lower than it usually is. <laughs> I've done a lot of talking up talking, here. Right? It's been too much talking, absolutely. You can't give me stink eye. I, I, I don't even know why you're giving me stink eye at this point. I'm just trying to focus. You're giving everyone the stink <laughs> just eye to focus. I, I'm, I'm sick as a dog, but having the time of my life. Well, see, there you go. Um, there's been a lot of great conversation uh, here, and I I think one of the news pieces that actually is coming out uh, mm -hmm. this morning in both the Detroit News and in the Detroit Free Press is um, this bid for mm -hmm. um, uh, for uh, Foxconn Technologies from Taiwan to locate their plant here in Michigan. And uh, a lot of sources confirming that and also taking a look at the governor and possibly Mayor Duggan mm -hmm. heading overseas to try to sure. get some kind of deal in place here. But really looking at the legislation that um, Governor Snyder said, we've got to move through to make sure we have the incentives to land something yeah. like that, Nolan. Yeah, and you know, Daniel Howells had the piece in the Detroit News uh, th this morning talking talking about the 5,000 jobs that could be coming here, this deal with a company, Taiwanese company called Foxconn. They make some kind of crystal display, I don't know. But- um, And your iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> no, I thought this one was for it's cars. Not your iPhone? I don't know. It, anyway, it's not the kind of jobs we're used to getting in Detroit. And if that doesn't wake the legislature up to the need to get off their ideological bicycle and pass you know, meaningful, uh, <laughs> Uh, legislation to help the economy of the city and the state. I can't think of anything. Well, this is a. Uh, wh when's the last time somebody's talked about 5,000 jobs? No, that's in a Detroit. lot. That's and it's, lot and, well, it's, and it's an over $4 billion investment. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that, th this is, this yeah. is a different scope. Just, yeah, I mean, this turns just, things upside down. It's not just the jobs, it's, it's once you land that kind of company, that kind of technology, right. what else then do you, do you attract? Uh, I mean, we've been losing out on making things like this in this country uh, and, and losing out in Michigan, especially on making stuff like this. If, if we can sort of turn that corner with a, a business like this, I think it helps us with some of the other things that we'd like, that we'd like to see. And you look yeah. at the incentive money we've spent over the year to grab 100 jobs, 150 yeah, no, it's never jobs at the time. Yeah. This is amazing if they can pull it off. And they're on their way over there now, I guess. All right, and, and we are not the only state, obviously, vying for this. And, yeah, and that's the whole it. thing. And so <laughs> is, 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 is Michigan positioned itself in the right place to say, we, we are the best place for something so, like this. So, I mean, we are the best place for something like this, not just because of uh, the, the, the business climate, which is what we always talk about, but because of the other kinds of infrastructure we have. We produce more engineers uh, at our universities than, than yeah. any place else yeah. 
in the in the country. Uh, we've got the the auto industry now really focused on high tech and you know mobility and things like that. Big All data. these things sort of tie tie in, and I, 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 it's always been a frustration for me why we can't get more of this uh, interest in in Michigan. And, and again, if we turn that corner, I think. It opens it opens an uh, an enormous amount of possibility for you. Get a company like that um, come in here and build partnerships with our research universities, mm -hmm. University of Michigan, as Steve Steve mentioned, uh, Michigan State, Wayne State. You, the potential is tremendous, and b both for those colleges, but also for, but for city the city and drawing in other businesses yeah. of of You'll similar to them. I mean, when you get, when you land one big fish like this, you know, you, they tend to school up. Yeah, they school up. And, al and also, even if that business expands, then maybe five years down the road, right. who's to say that then you couldn't have more jobs coming out? All right, well, that's going to bear watching over the, uh, over the next week or so, and also checking on the legislature to see what, they, what their movement is and mm -hmm. watching their budget process. Well, and when, we should yeah, also ahead. mention, look, Republican governor, Democratic mayor working together to create. So there's jobs. that civility in civility. politics that we've been right talking up there, about. They're on the plane together. Or <laughs> eating their don't you? Don't you wonder what the conversation's like? <laughs> <laughs> don't you want to be a fly on on the, on the plane? <laughs> fly on the wall for that one. All right. Hey, well, the, here's is it. What about Trump? I think is what they're saying. Both ones. I think there's a lot, a lot, of, a lot of silence <laughs> there. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, you know, civility and politics that we're talking about, education, opportunity, and inclusion were among the themes that dominated the messages and conversations at this year's policy conference. Here's a look back at some of the highlights for you. We're in the first period of growth in 50 or 60 years. People moving back. We have a chance to plan growth for the first time in half a century. And so every day we get up and say, what's the vision that's going to drive this? And we have one single guiding principle for those of you uh, who live or work in the city, those of you who are thinking about living or working in the city, you should know what the future looks like. And our principle is this. It's one city for all of us. We've got good long-term resources to strengthen the entire Flint water system, and there's a good term, long-term plan for water um, that's before the city council now, and I hope that gets approved. In addition, we're doing a lot of great things in education, nutritional programs, uh, job creation programs to strengthen Flint, because Flint had many challenges prior to the water issue. Let's make Flint even better and stronger as we go through this process. I think one thing that the board saw in my candidacy is someone that has led a large urban school district, one that with 130,000 students. Uh, prior to that, I was in Miami-Dade, the fourth largest school district in the country with over 300,000 students. So I think my work has always been about focusing on what matters most, which is what happens in the classroom. We know that we have a, we're heading into a teacher shortage. We have a lot less, about 50% less people going into education as a profession. Why and, do you think that is? Well, I think there's a couple reasons. One, I think education's been under attack for the last decade, so that's one reason. Second reason is pay, because we had a kind of a bad decade and schools had to cut. So there's a lot of school districts are hiring teachers at the 28 to 32,000 range. If this proposal is correct, if I understand it correct, we may be the only state that's part-time and term limited. So in theory, you could have somebody be Speaker of the House after 90 days on the job. It seems a little bit disconcerting. Yeah, I mean, I think we should have a conversation, but the legislature is closer to the people. You know, it's not often that somebody calls the governor or gets to meet with the governor and so forth. So the legislature actually is the conduit for the people to actually get their policies and their voices heard. I think a lot of people just look at Detroit as face value and they, they just skim past all the richness that's there. And frankly, the market that's there, it's an underserved market. So as chains continue to overlook Detroit at to some point, I think that they're missing a huge opportunity. And I hope that they look at successes like mine as there is a market there, it deserves to be served and we need to serve it. And we can serve it well, even better than they do out in the suburbs. It is uh, impossible to do the work we do uh, in isolation from the larger ecosystem of philanthropy and social change. So first of all, we are co-locating our office with the Kellogg Foundation. So mm -hmm. we work with Kellogg, we work with Kresge, we work with Knight, all the foundations here, Wilson. I mean, we work on different levers with all of them and we will only be as successful as we are willing to be collaborative. Late night tweeting, should the president put the phone down after 11 p.m.? Uh, I think that'd be a good thing. You know, sort of like Tiger Woods ought to stay home too after, after midnight. <laughs> 
I'm married to a man that I'm trying to get to put down that suit. <laughs> yeah. So what? Yeah. He actually has By a pretty, the way, he has, he has a pretty a good great record. follow. He, he has does. a great follow on Twitter. I will have to say. Uh, that three in the morning, best. right? What do you think? Uh, I recently said in a speech, I wish the president used Google more than Twitter, and I stand by that. <laughs> Just ending with a little bit of fun there. All right, so um, gentlemen, kind of the the big the big takeaways um, from this week. A lot of the big uh, the big conversations and and speakers. I think you remarked when you saw Darren Walker from the Ford Foundation that that was a really illuminating was a ses session. Session, yeah. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of of, of Darren Walker's, uh, but I thought what we got to see. Uh, up close in that session was what that commitment that Ford is, is trying to make to Detroit is really going to look like. I mean, this is a foundation that left Detroit uh, what, 60 some years ago and in a very controversial fashion and has struggled with that r relationship for a really long time. Uh, hiring a, a Detroit officer is a big, big move. And to hear him talk about the way they want to work collaboratively with uh, the other foundations now in Detroit, I think we're going to see some really big stuff uh, from them in the, in the next few years. I think it's really interesting, Nolan, and you made the point mm -hmm. how long can um, how long can these organizations continue to infuse the amount of cash, the amount of money and capital that they are doing in the city? Oh, they've got a lot of money, and right now it's... Uh, it's the largest foundation, yeah. I think, isn't it? But, you know, there's... Wilson Foundation is going to have to spend $2 billion over the next... 17, 18 years, uh, there's a ton of money in the foundations. And now they are protecting their investment in Detroit. They put a lot of money in. If they stop now, they roll back now, the risk is that the money they've planted, money they invested won't bear fruit. And I think you'll see a heavy commitment uh, for the foreseeable future. What about Mayor Mike Duggan? He uh, really took center stage this week. People um, loved his speech, and okay. I think it was what folks needed to hear. He, he, he certainly clarified his his reelection uh, message, and he made, really made Coleman Young Jr., third or second, his likely opponent who wasn't up Who's here. Who's not here. I mean, yeah. he made him look small. Was that, a bad, was that a bad move on Coleman <clears throat> Young's part to not be up here? If you're going to run for office in, in the <laughs> fall and you're not up here, I don't know, you can't even pretend to be serious. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Reggie Turner made this point earlier today that, that the business community has far more say over uh, Detroit elections mm -hmm. now than it used to, right? And that's mm -hmm. the, there's a lot of reasons that that's true. Some of it is the, the absence of other yeah. influences now. L uh, labor doesn't play quite the role that it used to. Uh, some of the other organizations are, are smaller and struggling with money. And so if you want to be the mayor, I think you gotta, I think you got to connect with the business community. Where else would you do it other than, than up here? I mean, uh, I, I would imagine that, that he's struggling with the idea of seeming too close, maybe, to, to business interests. He's trying to run more of a grassroots campaign. I'm for the people. Right. He's for the business But you leaders. need their money. Yeah. You need their money. Um, well, if that's the case, then he, if, if he's trying to make that, then he should have, been, he should have done an event on Belle Isle over the, over the <laughs> last couple. He <laughs> should might've. have done something to, right. to capture some of the attention, and he didn't. I think what was interesting about Mayor Duggan's speech that, that captured a lot of people was it was almost the lesson, the lesson on institutional racism in housing in, the, in kind of a history lesson mm -hmm. in the city of Detroit. I think that's what um, sparked a, a lot of conversation from people in, in, in realizing why things got the, got the way, they, what, the way yeah. they are and, and how you then tackle it now. Yeah, well, I mean, it was important for him to say that. It's important for all of us to be, to be saying that. We should, we should remark that lots of people have been saying that for a really long time, and uh, they get ignored. But he had a, diff but he had a different pushed. audience He here. had a different audience. He had great context for it. And let's, let's be honest, when, uh, when the white mayor of the city of Detroit says something like that, it lands on people's ears a little differently. It's not as easy to dismiss, especially in, in a crowd uh, like this. And so the significance of it uh, I think uh, takes on uh, greater proportion because of that. I, I, I think it's comparable to what we saw Mitch Landrew, who's the uh, the mayor of New Orleans, do last week when he gave a speech about why the Confederate monuments in that city uh, are coming down. Mm -hmm. People have been talking about that forever. Uh, that that these, this is a part of our history that we can't uh, treat the way that we do. They've been sort of pushed aside. When when somebody with that kind of role. Uh, and that kind of audience says it, 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 it gets a, a, a 
different reception. And he talked a lot about neighborhoods, but there's still mm -hmm. also up here, Nolan, uh, in terms of looking looking at business, a lot of focus on the development of downtown and how we're, we are seeing more and more, especially from uh, Dan Gilbert's crew, yeah. in terms of what's going to be happening next for them, too. Yeah, no, I had dinner with uh, uh, several of the um, Gilbert executives, Quicken executives the other night, and you know what they what they said is this last seven years have been incredible as we all know but we're not at that sustainable point now where we're at least where sustainability is inevitable and they said we need another five years of boom you know to get to that point where it's not as fragile and you know they also talked about you know their neighborhoods which you know they're starting to look at in a big way because they get a lot of criticism for just focusing on downtown. And, uh, you know, the, like everybody else, they didn't see much they could do in the neighborhoods until the education system is is fixed and yeah. until that's made right. Yeah, and that was a lot of conversation about um, Detroit Public Schools here with sure. Nikolai Vitti, yeah. um, who was up here. And I, I think it was good for him to make time to be up here for that one day. And he hit as many people as possible and did one session. And um, I think um, just from, from the view of what some people were telling <coughs> me, they were very excited about what he said. And now it's these, okay, now let's see what yeah. happens next. Yeah, there's so much pressure yeah. on this one person. And I, I always fear that, you know, yeah. we set people up for failure by, by assuming that. Like, all right, uh, what are you going to deliver right, in about by they September? Can, right, that they can do it and that they can do it fast. We, we do have to be patient. I know that's a really uh, difficult uh, thing to say when so many people who have to send their kids to Detroit public schools are, are struggling, but it's not gonna get fixed uh, with, with some magic wand. It's not gonna get fixed with some gimmick. There are deep systemic problems uh, in the system. There are deep systemic problems in the city that we've got to start sort of figuring out long-term ways to turn around. You know, he, go he's ahead. He's got Mom. a bigger job than, I, than Mayor Duggan, I think. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, Duggan had a, had a clearer path. We need to do this, this, and this. We've been trying to figure out how to fix the Detroit schools years. for, <laughs> yeah, and nobody's come up with a formula. And it's not just Detroit. Urban education has been a tough nut all over the country. Well, it's not even just urban education. Let's talk about Michigan K through 12. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, it's we, dismal. We're, we're having a tough time, and it was, um, you know, we talked about the 21st Century Commission report on education, yeah. that Governor Snyder um, commission that came out this spring, and it felt like everyone was kind of waiting to see what would, you know, be entailed in there. And I, I talked to State Superintendent Brian Whiston, and mm -hmm. you saw earlier in the, you know, in the package, mm -hmm. and they've got that, you know, these are the plans to be a top 10 yeah. state, and, and, you know, in 10 years. But there are so many moving parts to it. Some of it is governance. Some of it is investing a little bit more. And I know we've had the argument about how much money do you invest, and do you invest it in the right way. Um, I, I think when we saw this spring the uh, state reform office get together with the Michigan Department of Education and talking about the schools that could be closed but finding a plan for them instead of the closure uh, but at least you're seeing those two entities working together which uh, which again you've Slightly. had I mean we've had plan after plan after plan right. and report after report what we haven't had is a cohesive strategy that everybody has agreed on. There's not a single plan or strategy out there in the state that has universal support. And if you look at the states that have progressed, if you look at Tennessee and Florida or Colorado, Massachusetts, states that have pulled themselves up in terms of education, everybody from teachers to the business community had the same vision All right, and so they implemented it. Right now, we've got the governor in charge of education, the legislature medals in education, the state school board is, in, is has their a piece of, of the pie. Nobody's really in charge of pushing this thing ahead. What do you think? Uh, you know, someone made an interesting observation this week about the states where this has worked uh, and, and that uh, they are states where you had a split, but a party split between legislative leadership and gubernatorial, that, that these were bipartisan solutions. That was true in Massachusetts. Don't we have uh, that in Michigan? We <laughs> <laughs> you There's only one party now, right? <laughs> in the whole split. legislature. One party with several hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Um, that was true in, 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 in Tennessee in some form. I, I, I wonder if that is... Uh, we had that opportunity, We've I suppose, with, with Granholm. And, you know, what, uh, I mean, the one thing the education report said was we've got to put education under one person. And, the, and it recommended the governor because he's yeah. accountable to voters. I don't know We if can't I like have that. the education department pulling over here one way and controlled by 
its own group of interest, and sure. the governor over here controlled by another group of interest pulling this way. And the we're not going to say, get by the there. way, we're not going to fund that standardized test that we right. thought we were going to well, create. Well, the legislature. Ago, so we're just going to make something else up. A legislature driven wholly by I ideological. Uh, um, yeah, well, th th they're a concerns. problem. They're a, they're a huge yeah, problem. Yeah. I don't know if the one person thing. I don't know if I like that. And, and, and Most uh, other states uh, have it. They, they, I, I'm not sure that's true. They don't have true. what we have. But if you think about Massachusetts and Maryland, there's some shared power there. there. Is. The governor is a little more powerful well, than he about, is here. But, but you don't have of two of elected. elected. You, you don't. I, and I agree with that. I, I don't think there's, there's, there's any change or benefit in that. I mean, what you don't have in the other state is an elected school board. And an elected, elected governor. governor yeah. with, that is true. With no sort of overlap right. in terms That's of true. their authority. Okay. They have their separate authorities. All right. Let's talk about a couple of other things in the, in the time that we have mm -hmm. left. Um, let's talk about Governor Snyder his role, yeah. the time that he's got left in office, um, and maybe the, the, the will that of, of things that he can get done here. Well, it's, he's, a, he's a lame duck, and, and that's a hard yeah, place to be in. he's got a lot of time, in, though. But there's a lot of time left. There's enough Almost time. If you years. compare to his first two years in office, what he got done right off the bat, he did that in this amount of time. And so if, you, if he can take these reports, and I know they're <clears> going to try to do that and find pieces of them that they can implement now to at least get it started and let the next administration, Republican or Democrat, because most of these are shared ideas, I, let I them pick it up and go on. But he's got to get back out there and be the relentlessly positive governor that he was. Uh, you know, or get a score get, with some of bringing in some business. He's got to get out of the <laughs> bunker he went into after yeah. Flint. And yeah. Stephen? Uh, you know, it would also be helpful if the people who want to replace Governor Snyder right. would start talking about these reports and there make are it a few clear. Of them marching around here up on Mackinac. Yeah, this just, week. A couple, just a couple, right? Just a couple. But yeah. but start saying, you know, I like that idea, and right. if I win, I would do that, which would which will stop the legislature from trying to wait it out. Yeah. Uh, while while Snyder is still here, uh, if they know that whoever it is who's going to get elected uh, next year is is going to continue this, uh, it, it makes them take it. Uh, probably a little more seriously. Yeah, I mean, right. I think the thing to watch also is is the governor's race and, and who's jockeying for those positions right now. I think we saw a lot of um, roads, inroads being made yeah. um, by several candidates up here and also the idea of the part-time mm -hmm. legislature that uh, Brian Kelly made a huge show about up here <laughs> and, and winging out the legislature. They're Massive not too pleased fail. with that. They were not <laughs> He looked so embarrassed walking around there after <laughs> he that. I mean, been. he had no presence here after no. that. You pass him in the hallway and he just looked he he straight ahead. Home. The guy wasn't up here, wasn't <laughs> acting like a guy running for office in terms no. of engaging no. people. Oh, I you know, still don't how think he's going to run. You think he's going to run? I don't. Well, I don't know. I, I'm one one sure other thing I want to mention in 30 <laughs> seconds we have left, um, the Michigan, the congressional delegation and um, Debbie Stabenow and uh, Gary Peters, they're making great pains to tell everybody that they're all working together in terms of if they're from Michigan, there's a lot of a lot of joint pushes. They're up at the Sioux Locks today um, talking about yep, a, you know, a push are. there for legislation um, on the federal end, and they're also talking about saving the Great Lakes. A couple of things they're trying to say, like, look, we're, we're working together in Washington. I think that's important. Yeah. I mean, there's so little of that today. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, they do it more than, than we give them credit for, yeah. and uh, we should start to acknowledge it. All right. Well, hey, it's always been good to be up here with you guys. This is fun. This is our seventh year doing this. No Can way. you believe that? Is? We're looking younger and I younger every that. year as we pass. We ought to go back and got a clip from that first year. I, mm -hmm. Oh, I was, don't think we want to see was that. Was I bald then? <laughs> you still were, Nolan. Uh, I was bald then. Yeah. yeah. You, he was bald then. So there's hope for there's me. Hope. There's hope for Nolan. <laughs> all right, and finally tonight, we all know that Mackinac is famous for its fudge, but the swimming pool here at the Grand Hotel is also very well known. The guys at Under the Radar Michigan got the scoop on its fascinating history. You know, Christy, with all the incredible ideas and information that are being exchanged at this year's policy conference, my head is literally swimming. And speaking of swimming, the incredible swimming pool here at the Grand Hotel has an absolutely fascinating past. And when it comes to knowledge about this ceremonial cement pond, hotel historian Bob Taggetts definitely dives the deep end. So Bob, what's some cool under the radar type things about this pool people should know? Well, everybody, it's called the Esther Williams Swimming Pool, the famous movie star, the film that was made here, but it was built long before that. It was built in the mid 1920s and we'll promote anything here at Grand Hotel. We <laughs> called it Paul Bunyan's footprint because an identical pool was built in Traverse City. And we said when Paul Bunyan walked north, he stepped in Traverse City, he stepped on Mackinac Island and went north. 
Esther Williams, Xavier Cougat, Jimmy Durante, 1947, made one of her famous swimming films here. And we had no earthly idea of the power of Hollywood. It was shot in 47, it was released by MGM in 1949. People went insane. In 1950, we had the highest occupancy rate we'd ever had because of that movie. And in 1951, the hotel, recovering from World War II, started making its first solid profits. And it's because of that movie. We were so appreciative to Esther Williams, we built a suite in her honor. She used it her whole life. Amazing. And the grounds, I mean, the pool's beautiful. The pool house is awesome. It is. It's really, when you go up in that front porch, you immediately see the straits and you see the bridge, but you just look down a little bit. The pool just sparkles. A few years ago, we put the horse and carriage logo on the bottom of the pool, and that just adds so much to it. Plus, people don't realize when you're down here, it's probably the best view of the Grand Hotel. Grand Hotel is 660 feet long, so you got to have the right angle to really see the whole thing and truly appreciate it. And this is about the best spot going. Should we go for a swim? Yeah. <laughs> no way. No water wings. So if you're looking for a pleasing dip, well, you'll just have to walk around me and go see the incredible pool here at the Grand Hotel. It's awesome. I'm surprised they didn't dive in. All right, that's gonna do it for our coverage from Mackinac Island. We'll see you next week for My Week. Take care. Did you know Gordon Food Service was started by a 23-year-old entrepreneur as a butter and egg delivery business more than a century ago. In 1948, school teacher Gerard Wendell Hayworth borrowed $10,000 from his parents to start a woodworking operation in his family's garage. It's now Hayworth Incorporated. These are just some of the ways Michigan's pioneers started out as small companies with big ideas. We are business leaders for Michigan. We are committed to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding for this program is provided by Delta Airlines. Keep climbing.